Hey everybody, so you're looking at the Vivo X27 Pro. This phone was released about a month ago, but I think it was only released in China. So that explains why there are not a lot of English videos on this phone on YouTube yet, because I believe Vivo only gave out devices to Chinese media. So I was able to source the phone, even though I'm usually not a fan of Chinese ROMs, but I figured I might as well do a video and put this phone to the test for my YouTube audience. So I, I think it's a good thing that Vivo did not release this phone internationally because this is very, very similar to the Vivo V15 Pro that I tested two months ago. In fact, I'm just going to go over the differences really quick because there are not that many. So the first major difference is the X27 Pro's display is a little bit larger, 6.7 inch compared to the 6.4 inch of the Vivo V15 Pro. And this display has an elongated aspect ratio. It's even longer than the usual 19.5 by nine that we've seen on other phones already. So I know this because I put the X27 Pro side by side with other phones, such as the Galaxy S10 Plus, and here the Huawei P30 Pro. And even though the Vivo X27 Pro has a larger display, they're about the same riff in terms of left to right. So you see right here, the P30 Pro is a little bit thinner, that's because it has curved screens. Otherwise, if you put the two screens side by side, they're about the same. So this is definitely something like probably 20 or 20 and a half by nine aspect ratio. So that makes the phone a little bit easier to grip. There's also a one hand mode that's uh, kind of tricky to trigger, but I did manage to get it right away. So the other difference is the X27 Pro has a 4,000 mAh battery. The V15 Pro only has a 3,700 mAh. But that extra 300 probably won't matter much because the V15 Pro already had excellent, excellent battery life. Now also, the X27 Pro has a slightly better processor. This phone runs on Snapdragon 710. So you see the Geekbench scores right here. So Snapdragon 710 on the X27 Pro, whereas the V15 Pro is on the Snapdragon 675. And that's kind of where most of the similarities end. There is still a little couple of differences here and there. So this phone has a triple camera setup very similar to the V15 Pro, but the wide angle lens here on X27 Pro, it's a 13 megapixel shooter. On the V15 Pro, if you remember, it's an eight megapixel. So this is more pixel dense. You'll be able to get a wide angle shot. It's a little bit more crisp and you can zoom in, crop in a little bit more. Otherwise, exactly the same main camera. This is a 48 megapixel sensor with an F1.8 aperture. And the depth sensor is slightly different, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, these depth sensors are kind of gimmicks. Neither this phone nor the V15 Pro can really take bokeh images that well. And then finally, the last major difference is that the X27 Pro has a glass body, whereas the V15 Pro has that kind of plasticky body that felt a little bit cheap. Oh, and charging. The X27 Pro charged via USB-C, finally. The V15 Pro was on micro USB, boo. So other than that, that's about it. Like day-to-day -day performance are very, very similar. And uh, as you already guess, and you could probably tell if you follow smartphone news, this phone has a pop-up camera. Now, obviously this is a different pop-up camera module. It's it's wide and there's a little light that pops up. It's kind of flashy, but I don't think it does anything. It's very, very gimmicky. But I do find that this pop-up camera is really fast. I tested this side by side next to another phone I'm testing right now with a pop-up camera that I can't reveal yet. And I can say the X27 Pro's pop-up camera, it's coming up a little bit faster. You can actually change the different colors. So you can go into settings and right here, they'll let you change the different colors of the pop-up light. So again, very gimmicky. I, I don't really see what this does other than, other than it looks cool. Oh yeah, 32 megapixel selfie camera too, just like on the V15 Pro. So like I said, very, very similar. Um, this phone also has an in-display fingerprint reader and it's very, very fast. So this fingerprint sensor is developed by Goodix. Uh, Goodix, G-O-O-D-I-X. They are a Chinese company based in Shenzhen that develop in display fingerprint readers. And I think their version is the best. It's better than what Samsung is using on the S10 Plus and what um, the Samsung A70 is using too. That's also an optical sensor, but it's a different company. So this is an optical sensor. And I know MKBHD always complains about optical sensors being I don't know, he, he says he doesn't like the light shining in, in on his finger. I don't know why. I don't really see a problem with it. This is definitely way better than the Galaxy S10 fingerprint sensor. It's so fast, so accurate. So overall, despite the large screen, this phone fits in the hand pretty nicely. Um, overall, hardware is okay. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of uh, Oppo and Vivo's thing 
they do where the screen kind of has a sharp edge right here. I believe they managed to fix it for the OnePlus 7 Pro though. I'm getting my hands on that soon. I'm really excited. But back to this phone, there's still the sharp edge here. This is a complete nitpick on my part, but hey, I'm going to nitpick the hell uh, all my phones. So in terms of buttons, you have a power button on the right side and volume rockers above it. And they're both pretty clicky, pretty tactile, pretty responsive. On the left side, you have a physical AI button. So now this is the China model of the phone. So this button will trigger Jovi, which is which is a uh, Vivo's AI assistant. If, if this phone were to be released internationally, I assume this will launch Google Assistant. Up top, you have a headphone jack. That's awesome. And the packaging comes with an earphone too. That's because Vivo started out as a music company. They made MP3 players, so they still want to um, not give up on the audio file aspect. On the bottom, you have a single bottom fine speaker grill, a dual SIM tray slot that also um, supports SD cards, and a USB-C port. So now in terms of performance, the Snapdragon 710 here performs very similar to the 675 from the other phone that I tested. Day-to-day -day performance, you're not going to notice any issues at all. Playing games, I played Mortal Kombat and Asphalt 9. Both games ran very smoothly with no frame rate problems, and the phone did not heat up. There's 8 gigs of RAM in this phone, I forgot to mention. So 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs of internal storage. And I believe this is the standard configuration. There is no 6 gigs version. So this phone definitely has no issues in terms of performance. Now, one area where the 710 drastically improves over the 675 is in video stabilization. So this camera can shoot videos at up to 4K resolution. But at 1080p, you get really, really good stabilization. So you see, this is completely EIS, but this is the Snapdragon 710 and Vivo's algorithm at play here because the Vivo V15 Pro videos were jerky as hell. So I guess that's the difference between a 710 chipset and a 675. We'll check out one more video. Yeah, I'm impressed with this. This is a 1080p resolution. You see the sound output is pretty nice. This is smooth. Let's check out nighttime recording too. I think nighttime, then you see the stabilization takes a hit. But that, that's the case with every phone. Even flagship phones. So yeah, see there's a lot of micro jitter in this now. Okay, while we're at it, we might as well jump into the camera. So as I mentioned, this is a 48 megapixel sensor. Unfortunately, it's a Samsung sensor, not a Sony sensor with an f1.8 aperture. That means it's not a true 48 megapixel sensor, it's interpolated. It's really just a 12 megapixel lens. You have a 13 megapixel wide angle lens here and a two megapixel depth sensor. So overall, photo quality is good, but not great. Like I've seen better from even the Meiju 16S. So you see right here, this is really good details, really good colors, and very punchy photo all around, but this is a really easy shot to take. Now, this is a more difficult shot. This is against backlight, and then you see the dynamic range suffers a little bit. This is another selfie taken backlight, and uh, like you see, my face is completely mushy, and it just doesn't look real. I mean, look at my, my facial hair. It doesn't, it doesn't look good at all. But this is a very challenging shot because it's against backlight. Now, when it's a normal lighting situation, and this selfie turns out a little bit better. So you see, this is a standard shot. This is 12 megapixel. I wouldn't suggest shooting in 48 megapixel with this camera because it's a fake 48 megapixel anyway. Now, you can go to wide angle shot. You just get a lot more into the frame. And uh, I think the distortion is pretty, it's okay. It's a lot better than the Galaxy S10. There's not too much major distortion. The field of vision right here is I'd say about 107 degrees. So you see this shot, this nice shot is pretty nice, but this one I had to tweak exposure setting by tapping on the viewfinder and, and tweaking the settings myself. And now this is wide angle. And when you shoot wide angle, same thing. You're gonna lose a little bit of details in the middle. Like this is a little bit blurry exposure is off so you're gonna have to do tweaks yourself now this is another wide angle shot but i tweaked the settings and now you see this looks pretty clean but if you go really far in you still see a little bit of soft details right here like a lack of clarity now bokeh images there's a dedicated depth sensor so you can when you're shooting bokeh you can actually tweak the aperture to adjust the depth of field blur but unfortunately i just think ultimately the edge detection is not that good so you see right here i took four images 
only one came out nice like this one you see it blurred the top of the ice cream that's not what i was going for right here it messed up the top of the ice cream again finally this one turned out pretty nice edge detection on this one is on point and the depth of field blur around the other ice cream my girlfriend looks pretty nice so this is a good shot out of like four or uh, three so it's a 33 percent shooting percentage so not too great now this is another nice shot that i had to tweak exposure and once i did this is a very nice image very well balanced none of the lights are overexposed and colors are very punchy without being fake and shutter speed is relatively okay too if i shoot this same shot with a samsung galaxy s10 i think these people will look a little bit more blurry because the galaxy s10 slows down shutter speed so much so now in terms of really low light performance so i took this shot inside my dark bedroom see it's it's really dark but then there's a night mode in this phone and once i turn on night mode you get a really respectable shot now this shot it's actually better than the same shot i took with the iphone 10s so this phone it's a mid-tier device from vivo it actually beats the iphone 10s in really low light performance but of course is no match for the huawei p30 pro which is the low light king right now i do think at 550 us i i wish performance were a little better i think i can get better performance out of the $450 Meiju 16S and a OnePlus 6 T right now, which is probably around the same price. So now let's go over software really quick. So Vivo's software is called FunTouch and it's really weird. So basically when you swipe down from the notification shade, you see there are no shortcut toggles right here. Instead, shortcut toggles are in the swipe up menu. And you see, this is a new aesthetic that Vivo went for. Before, when you swipe up, it only filled up the lower third of the screen now it fills up the entire screen now this looks even more like a rip off of the iphone's control center so you see you swipe up and then you are able to change your brightness and all of that and then you have shortcut toggles right here and you frequently use apps and then immediately you can you can open a rechat weibo but this is a chinese phone so these are apps that chinese people use a lot so i guess it's very useful to have everything on one man on, on one swipe up menu but with that said, Vivo software actually does bring some useful shortcuts and gestures. For example, you can double tap on the screen to lock the phone, double tap on the screen to turn on. I really like that. I don't like needing to reach for the power button every time. And this swipe up menu, as I mentioned, is quite useful. And then you have this really useful shortcut that allows you to record screen and grab a long screenshot all that. And I believe you can use three finger screen three finger screenshots too. Yeah, right there. So pretty useful. There's a lot of shortcuts for you to do and also there are some fun features for chinese users so for example when you go into a web page and then you long press on a word this uh jovi which is vivo's assistant will pop up and actually you want to translate and you see it just translated this paragraph into english so um, unfortunately you can't use this in chrome this only works when you use vivo's own stock uh, web browser which is not that useful but if you live in china you probably don't mind if you live in china you probably want to use vivo's apps because you can't use google apps that well anyway so i guess this is very useful for chinese users but for us i guess it's more of a gimmick okay so you know what we gotta do time for a video speaker test so there's a single bottom fine speaker at the bottom so it's 50 percent volume right now We'll go up to max volume. So speakers are kind of weak. Uh, even at max volume, it's quite low and there's virtually no bass. Yeah, so that's about it for the Vivo X27 Pro. This phone sells in China for 4,000 RMB, which is about 580 US dollars. At this price, I think it's a little bit too expensive because we saw a couple days ago, the Meiju 16S has a Snapdragon 855 chipset and it sells for 450 bucks. And that phone is a better design than this phone, in my opinion. It feels better. Um, and then also at this phone for 550, you might as well just pay a little bit more and get something like a OnePlus 6T or the upcoming OnePlus 7. That should be maybe a hundred dollars more. But that's the nature of Vivo and Oppo phones. They tend to overcharge a little bit compared to other Chinese brands. Like a Xiaomi Mi 9 has a much better chipset than this, and it's like 150 bucks cheaper. So this is a nice phone, nice design, but a little bit overpriced Vivo. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching.